character that you're playing. Okay? I'm John Holton, and I'm the narrator. Okay. I'm Peter Nicholson, and I'm playing the part of Billy Jack. Okay. I'm Adina Lawson, and I'm playing Maggie Newberg. I'm Thad Kellum, and I'm playing Tom. Jamie Kelly, and I'm playing Annabelle the Child. Okay. Constance Silva, and I'm reading Cassie. Okay. Sue Neal, and I'm reading Erica. Alden West, I'm Brittany. Al O'Connell, reading Gus Ramirez. Okay, great. for the year. The teaser, Fade In. The Coughlin Den Day. Tom Coughlin, mid-thirties, sits beside Annabelle, his ten-year-old daughter, and watches a rocket launch on television. What's it like up there? I'm told it's like nothing in the world. You'll let me know? Maybe I'll tell you when it's really happening. I hear there are some kind of fancy gizmos that will let, me, let us video chat every day while I'm up there. Hmm. You're silly, Dad. Tom rustles her head, ruffles her hair lovingly. Mom said you decided you wanted to go up in space when you were nine years old. That's right. <clears throat> I decided for sure when I was just about your age. How soon do you think it will? It will be your turn to go up. Not real soon. My friend Suzuki is ahead of me. He's going up next. Well, when you do go up, Mom left a surprise gift for you to take. A gift? <laughs> what do you mean? Mom and I bought it before she got too sick to go shopping. Maggie is keeping it safe until you leave for your space trip. What is it? It's got to be a surprise. Alaska's from Mom is what she said. Something for you to take with you to keep you safe up there. Then that's something I can look forward to. Affirmative. For mom. <laughs> Affirmative. Annabelle looks at Tom. He stares at the screen. Annabelle reaches out for his hand. Fade out, end teaser. Act one, interior, Maggie's kitchen, afternoon. Annabelle and Maggie Mexborn a wheelchair-bound elder, older woman, eat ice cream at the table. Tom enters. Do I smell ice cream? Silly, you can't smell ice cream. That's as good as the rest of Maggie's cooking. Affirmative. Dad will have to eat freeze-dried ice cream in space. Rather have Maggie's right here. When will it be your turn? No time soon. We saw a launch on TV this morning. It's taking supplies up to the uh, space station. No people, just food and stuff. You know, when your daddy was your age, he'd be sitting right there telling me that he was going to go up in one of those rocket ships. Mm. That's what mom told me. But she started crying when she said it. She told me she was crying because she knew he'd be so happy. Annabelle looks down at the phone. Gotta call Emma. Annabelle exits. Tom shoves his dish away, props his elbows on the table with his head in his hands. I feel guilty. Space used to be everything. Then I lost Janet. Now I'm confused. 
How can I leave Annabelle all alone? Janet knew she was dying. She hired a top-notch agency to find a great nanny for Annabelle. I'm still tempted to quit the program. But you've got to go up. You can't teach Annabelle to be a quitter. Remember, I'm right next door. You know darn well I'm going to watch over her, just like she was my own. At least I'm not next in line. There's plenty of time before that dilemma comes up. Interior of the Coughlin living room later. The doorbell sounds. Annabelle walks toward the door, looks up from her phone to open the door for mission control specialist Gus Ramirez. Uncle Gus, come in. Dad. How are you, how you doing, Ding Dong? Dad. Did you know? Ding Dong. You know, Annabelle? Bell. Bell ringing. Ding Dong. Hilarious. Uncle Gus, see you later. I've got homework. Annabelle exits while texting on her phone. What's up? I didn't want to tell you on the phone. Suzuki's hurt bad. Piled up on the interstate last night. How bad? Bad. He's going to be out of commission for months. I'm telling you this on the down low. You're up next, my friend. Your dream is coming true. I can't believe it. <laughs> the dream I've had since I was a kid is finally coming true. You better believe it, amigo. But wait. Takeoff's in two weeks. What about Annabelle? Yep. Better start getting that Super Nanny ASAP. I can't leave this fast. You know and I know, if you don't take this slot, you'll end up babysitting at the control room with me. You'll never get up there. Two weeks? You can do it. It's either walk away or fly to the stars. But buddy, you gotta push that start button right now, because you're heading on up. Interior, Annabelle's room, night. Tom enters. Annabelle is sitting on her bed, texting on her phone, while Rusty, her dog, is lying beside her. What's up? Gus just told me about a sudden change in flight schedule. Now I'm the astronaut going up to the space station next. Annabelle is surprised. What are you telling me? What does next mean? That means <clears throat> I will leave in just two weeks. I'll be heading up myself. It's my turn. Annabelle reaches for Rusty and pulls the dog into her lap. So mom's big plan is a go? She set the agency plans all up. Super nanny time. How fun. <laughs> Mom regards her with a doubtful expression. I'll call that agency first thing in the morning. If you're sure you're OK with this. Of course. Mom was. We talk, we talk about it a lot. Then you'll have to help me choose the nanny. No problem. Yay, you're blasting off. I get it. This is your dream. I'll text Emma right away. She reaches for a phone. You don't have a problem with this? I can make rockets fly, but I can't figure out your brain. Of course not. You're just a parent. <laughs> but look, you're really OK? Why wouldn't I be? Mom was. Maybe I'll even miss you like crazy. Or maybe not. We'll see. Just remember, I love you, no matter where I am. Affirmative. Tom hugs her, slowly leaves her alone in the room. Annabelle picks up Rusty and hugs him tightly, with tears running down her cheeks. You know, I'll be here for you every day, right? I would never leave you like Dad is leaving me. The lady that's coming better like dogs, and scratch your ears like Mom did. If she doesn't, we can figure out ways to make her go away. You can help me. That might be fun. I want Mom back. No one could replace her, certainly not somebody who gets paid money. I know you miss her, too. And maybe you'll miss Dad a little. I miss him right now because he's kind of sort of still here, but his mind's already in space most of the time. I wish he had a regular job right here in the neighborhood. Then it wouldn't be so tough to be his kid. I sure miss mom. Exterior of soccer field, day. Kid's soccer game is going on behind him. Tim leans on his car and stares at the game while talking into the phone. Yes, I know it's sudden. I just found out myself. My wife told you it might be on a very short notice when she set this all up with you. Tom frowns as he listens to the phone. Yes, 
I know the fees double for a rush job. Come stairs to the soccer game with the phone in New Zealand. Good. I need to start nanny interviews by tomorrow at noon. <clears throat> yes, in my home. You have the address. Let me know what to, when to expect the first candidate. Tom nods and smiles. I'm depending on your firm's fine reputation. Tom hangs up, heads for the soccer game. Fade out, end the back wall. Act two, interior of the Coughlin, Coughlin living room, day. Tom sits across from Erica, the first interviewee. She giggles a lot. Can I get you anything to drink? Do you have any alkaline water? Uh, no, uh, <laughs> what is alkaline water? It's just the best. I swear by it. Well, what is it? <laughs> At least you're open-minded. The last people who interviewed me thought it was a drug or some kind of alcohol, as if. The agency wouldn't tolerate it, and I don't do anything like that anyway. Good to hear. Alkaline water is an amazing health drink. Just great for your immune system. It would be so good for Annabelle. It would change her life. <coughs> How do you feel about German chocolate cake? <laughs> Allowed. Uh, I mean, she'll be eating kale and drinking lots of beet juice, too. We've never had kale in this house. Tom hands over a stack of legal papers. Erica reads through them and stares at Tom. I can't sign this. Is it the kale? No, I, I mean I can't sign a non-disclosure agreement. Not signing is not an option. But I'll be writing a book about raising Annabelle. No, no, no. <laughs> My private life and my daughter's is not up for grabs. It's not as if I'm going to do a YouTube channel about it. It's a book. You'll be famous. I can see the story now. Me and the astronaut's kid against the world. New York Times bestseller. Well, thank you for your time. I'll keep you in mind when I make my decision. I can just see the movie now. I'm dying to play myself. Who do you want to play you? I'll keep that thought in mind. Interior of the Cochrane living room, day. Tom sits across from Brittany, the second interviewer. Your child development coursework is impressive. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to sneeze on you. Does Annabelle like sports? I do. Loves them. You'll get along great. She hands Tom a printed schedule. Z at 5 a.m. three days a week during school and every day on weekends. We'll get up and either yoga or take a brisk walk. It's the Scandinavian way. Fresh air. Uh, do you have to have a TV in this living room? Going TV free is the best for children. Well, uh, limit the TV and, <laughs> and maybe get up early on weekends. Annabelle has soccer most Saturdays. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm sneezing and wheezing here. You don't have a dog, do you? The back door rattles. <laughs> Rusty the dog comes barreling into the room, heads straight for Brittany, who sneezes uncontrollably. <laughs> Frightened, she jumps up and backs towards the door. No, 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 this, this will never do. No, no dogs. He'll have to go. Rusty won't hurt you. I don't care. It's either the mutt or me. Interior of Maggie's kitchen, afternoon. Maggie and Billy Jack Fortman, the cranky version of anyone on HGTV, fuss over a repair to her dishwasher. The TV is on in the kitchen. A news broadcast plays on TV. A test rocket blasts off. That's the second time you've fixed my dishwasher. Third. Then that's three times too many. Appliances aren't supposed to break down in the first place. Oh, it don't matter. Uh, kids, have me, uh, kids have me on a monthly retainer for all these things. Yeah, just like uh, Tom's going to have them now. Uh, he's away. <laughs> you know, I, I can't believe that Tom is, is really planning to go up in two weeks. Billy Jack sits back on his heels and looks at Maggie. Uh, Maggie, you know, for, for you, uh, I'm available anytime day or night. <laughs> you just snap your fingers and, uh, or anything, you know. I, uh, <clears throat> I 
Could be closer if you like. I, I know, but we're doing, we're doing just fine, just the way we are right now. <laughs> right. <laughs> In Paris, Maggie looks away, and the silent TV catches her eye. She gasps. Billy Jack turns towards the TV. The rocket explodes. Maggie and Billy Jack freeze in horror. That's not like my dad's. Maggie and Billy Jack turn to see Annabelle in the kitchen door. She looks visibly upset. Maggie quickly turns off the TV. That's testing for a Mars mission, and it's a US rocket. Dad says they're taking shortcuts to save money. Shortcuts didn't work, huh? And Maggie re reaches out for her, but Annabelle runs away. She sure is acting grown up because uh, because he's leaving. You know, but just last week, just last week she was that that little kid he pushed in the backyard swing. Oh, it's going to be hard on all of us. It's going to be hard uh, on Tom, no matter how grown up she is. It's going to be hard on everybody. Interior Coughlin living room day. Tom sits across from Cassie Vaughan, the third interviewee. Can I get you anything, Miss Vaughan? It's Cassie. Tell me about your daughter. <laughs> Annabelle's quite a girl. Never in trouble. An excellent student. What are her likes? On top of her schoolwork, she loves her sports. So, what does this job entail? 100% responsibility for Annabelle and this home. Plus? Be a friend. Give her guidance. Sounds possible. So how do you feel about four months? Perfect. I need to be back at school then. <laughs> your resume says you're working on your dissertation. On what? Comparing and contrasting parent-child relationships in Victorian times. Absolutely fascinating to consider from today's point of view. So are you planning for an academic career? It's a safe place to be, and quite intellectually rewarding. Why do you want this job? The money to finish my graduate studies. What's the number one reason I should hire you? Besides what's on my resume, Annabelle's story is not unlike my own. What do you mean? I lost my mother at the age of 12. You'd really understand what she's going through. Yes, but I had two younger sisters to look after as well. It must have been rough, but a great experience for this job. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Why hire someone for your daughter? I don't want to uproot Annabelle. We have no close relatives. She's been through so much for losing her mother five months ago. Janet knew how sick she was and arranged for your agency to find a fantastic nanny. Maggie next door helps out. She'll be a great backup, but I can't ask her to take on this completely. Janet and I thought this would be the best option. Gus bursts into the room. Oh, sorry. Uh, Gus sees Cassie and gives her a big smile. Haven't learned enough yet? Front door was unlocked. Can you see I'm in the middle of something? What do you want? I need to see you in private for just a minute. Tom it's urgent. Me. Tom looks from Cassie to Gus. Excuse me just a minute, please. Tom and Gus exit. Interior of the Coughlin's kitchen moments later. Tom turns to Gus without sitting down. What's so important? She's a looker. I choose this one. Look, pal. Something's urgent. I just found out, but it still isn't public. Good news and bad. The budget's been cut. What that means to you is that your flight time has been extended. It's gone from four months to a full year. A year? Impossible! I'm afraid it's true. Bob, you don't want to know as soon as possible, even before you finish interviewing. What am I going to do? What you've always been planning to do. Go out of this world. Interior of the Coughlin living room moments later. Tom re-enters the living room, sits back down, and looks at Chris and Cassie. So, how do you feel about this job lasting for a year? Oh, no, 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 no. I need to re just return to school in four months. Are you sure a year is too long? You could work on your dissertation right here. 
no expenses and a salary. We can make it work. But I... It's a winning situation for you. Degree and money. And helping Annabelle. Maybe it's possible. Tom rises to dismiss Cassie. I can understand your problem with your time frame. Thank you for coming. Tom and Cassie proceed to the front door. As Tom starts to reach the handle to open the door, Cassie screams. <gasps> Quickly, she stoops to pick up, to scoop up a cricket just before Tom steps on it. She laughs as she tosses it out of the front door to safety. Uh, sorry, I'm such a softie. That's what my dad keeps telling me. <laughs> you got the job of youth. You and Annabelle connect. I think she needs you. For a whole year? For a whole year. It will work for you. You'll see. Fade out. End of Act 2. Act 3. Interior of the Coffin House. Continuous dead. Tom opens the front door and sees Cassie standing there with two suitcases. Welcome, Cassie. Cassie enters with the suitcases, puts them down just inside the door. Annabelle and, Ru and Rusty race excitedly into the room. Annabelle stops suddenly, a few feet from Cassie. Cassie, you said yes. I knew you were the right choice the first time we met on Skype. You are quite an impressive young lady online, you know? I thought we could see how it goes in person. Cassie rubs Rusty behind the ear. Well, I'm operating on the assumption that her luggage says it's affirmative. Tom grabs the suitcases. <clears throat> Let me put these in your room. Which one? Going to put her in the spare bedroom. Annabelle levels a scathing look at Tom. Seriously, Dad? Why? That's Mom's quilting room. I can sleep anywhere. I can't put her in my room, Annabelle. That was your mom's, too. <laughs> Annabelle looks first at Cassie and then at her dad. OK. We'll just move Mom's quilting supplies to your room, Dad. That might be okay while you're away. Annabelle reluctantly goes towards the spare bedroom. Cassie and Tom exchange glances. Tom picks up Cassie's suitcases and follows. Interior of Annabelle's bedroom night. Tom knocks and walks in on Annabelle while she's curled up with Rusty. Doing okay? Annabelle looks over and hugs Rusty. It's fine, Dad. Whatever. All right. Good night, Annabelle. Good night, Rusty. Interior of the Coughlin kitchen night. Tom, wearing nothing but pajama bottoms, enters the kitchen. He sees Cassie, wearing a long t-shirt and belted short robe, eating cereal at the kitchen table. Both pause in embarrassment. Oh, sorry, I thought I'd come for a glass of milk. I was hungry, couldn't sleep. Guess it's just because it's a, a, a new room and a new bed. There's an awkward silence. Tom goes to the cabinet, takes out a glass, opens the refrigerator to get the milk. He pours a glass, puts the milk back. Uh, taking this back with me. Uh, see you in the morning. Night. Night. Touching the glass tightly, Tom quickly exits. Interior Maggie's kitchen the next mm -hmm. morning. Maggie, Cassie, and Tom Sit round the kitchen table. Tom grabs a cookie from a plate on the table. We always spend a lot of time in Maggie's kitchen. I started hanging out here when I was an eight-year-old kid who moved next door. He was here so much I just assumed he was one of my kids too. Best friends with my Eddie ever since, even though Eddie's in California these days. And I'm still hooked on her German chocolate cake. Even Annabelle checks in daily to see what's available to eat in the kitchen. And you're just as welcome too, Cassie. Maggie's kitchen is a tasty perk for this job you're taking on. She'll be a bedrock for you the whole time I'm away. Glad you signed on to help with Annabelle. What convinced you to take the job? Talking to Annabelle. I understand her situation. My dad was always gone, too. I, I found out firsthand how hard it is when a parent has to pay more attention to his job than his kids. Maggie looks from Cassie to Tom, back again. Anyway, welcome. <laughs> Second that. And about Annabelle, time to get down to business. This is about all those things you made me sign. Tom hands a document to Maggie. 
This gives you power of attorney while I'm gone. Tom hands each of them an envelope. And this is the banking info you, you two need, including credit cards. House security code here too? Yep. Do you set it every night? Yep. This is a pretty safe neighborhood, but you might as well, might as well use it anyway. Safety first and all that. Tom gives Cassie a bunch of papers. Here are all the important passwords, the gas company, water, electric company, and of course, Netflix. They both laugh. <laughs> Cassie hesitates. But if something breaks down, then our neighborhood fixer hero flies to the rescue. Billy Jack is on retainer for a lot of us, including Maggie. Any problems, he'll fix, fix it himself or get somebody who will. His phone number is on the list. He even supervises the yard work, too. He's pretty important to us all. What if something breaks down for you up there? Have you planned for that? He's coming back. But just in case. Of course. It's all about Annabelle. Everything you'll ever need in an emergency is in my safety deposit box. But I'm sure you'll never have any reason to use it. Not a chance. Annabelle walks into the room. Is this a Annabelle strategy session? <laughs> Girl's too smart. Tom winks playfully at Annabelle and passes the cookie plate. Too smart for her own good. <laughs> Annabelle hugs her dad and takes a cookie. I'm smart enough to teach you to play Rocket Quest this morning. Oh, you two and your video games. Tom turns back to Cassie. Only a couple more things and we're done. Tom slides a set of keys to Cassie. To the house. And I can give you the security code. Thanks. Tom slides another set of keys to Cassie. These are for the blue SUV in the garage. Tom pulls away from her dad. But that's Mom's. Can't she, can't she just use your Corvette? <laughs> I'm sorry, honey. Nobody drives my baby. She's going up on blocks. I got my own transportation. Yeah, I've seen your transportation. I don't want my daughter right in that map. It's terminal. Please use the SUV. Annabelle looks from one to the other, then nods and takes another cookie. Embarrassed, Cassie looks down at the accumulation of papers and keys on the table. Interior of the Cochran House, day. A party is in full swing. On hand are Annabelle, Tom, Cassie, Maggie, Billy Jack, and Gus. Gus raps on his glass to get everyone's attention. We all want to wish Tom happy trails as he rockets into the wild blue yonder. Everyone turns and raises a glass. Happy, happy trails. trails, Tom! I'm sure Cassie here will do a fine job. She raises, he, he, Gus raises his glass and smiles at her. And I'm here to keep an eye on her. And we're here to keep an eye on you. The group laughs. Tom frowns. Maggie beckons Annabelle and passes her a gift-wrapped box. Annabelle walks to Tom. And this is for Dad from Mom. She wrapped it all up for this trip to keep him safe on his trip. She holds out the box to Tom. He takes it and hugs Annabelle a fraction longer than normal. Thank you, honey. And I'm sending a thank you to Mom, too. He opens the box, a close-up of a horseshoe charm on a longish chain within the box. Tom looks inside and then pulls out the necklace. Tom hands the necklace to Annabelle and bends for her to put it around his neck. She places the necklace round his neck and kisses him on the cheek. From me and Mom, from Mom and me, have a great trip. That's wonderful, honey. Thank you. See the horseshoe turns up to keep all the luck inside. I'll wear it all the time I can. Otherwise, it'll be in my PPK. PPK? It's about half the size of one of my shoe boxes. That's where he carries all his personal stuff, like pictures and stuff. Personal, personal preference kit, <laughs> PPK. Even carry my shiraka sauce in it. To spice up my suppers. Oh, yeah! <laughs> Sometimes I need it, believe me. Spacemen don't cook anything like Maggie. Dad's going to fly to southern Russia for the International Space Station liftoff. The van, the van will take him to the plane that will fly him to where the launch will be. Gus looks out of the window. Van's here, pal. Time to head out. 
Annabelle hugs Tom hard. Everyone else steps back to let them have their moment. Maggie, Gus, and Billy Jack call goodbye to Tom. Goodbye, Tom. You're going to be all right, honey. We'll talk every day. Affirmative. Tom hang, hugs Annabelle one last time, picks up his gear, and walks out the door. Annabelle reaches out to Cassie, who puts an arm around her shoulders. After a moment, Annabelle looks at Cassie and pulls away from her. She picks up Rusty to hug, breaks into tears, and runs from the room. Fade out. End Act Three. Tag. Interior of the Kaufman kitchen, night. Annabelle is sitting at the table with a mostly empty glass of milk before her. She's been crying. Rusty is like looking up at Annabelle. Cassie enters and pauses in surprise. Couldn't sleep? First night is tough, huh? I guess. I'm just missing him a lot more than I ever imagined. Let's try thinking about something fun to do tomorrow. What's that video game you and Dad were playing? Rocket Quest. Can you teach me how to play? Yeah, sure. It's easy. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not very good at video games. I'm a good teacher. Oh, let's hope you're good enough for this difficult <laughs> student. And, and we can tell Dad when he calls that we're playing around with rockets and space things, too. Shall we try playing right after breakfast tomorrow morning? Affirmative. Annabelle rises and places her glass in the sink. Ready for bed now, you think? Affirmative. Annabelle smiles. They both rise and turn to leave the room. Come on, Rusty. There's no place like home. Cassie turns out the light as they exit. Fade out, end of show. character, uh, not, not bring, breaking over your head, but these are moments, nuances about the characters that are stronger now, uh, which is good for the actor and good for the audience. And I think we need to keep reminding them once or again that he's going to video chat with his daughter whenever he wants to, because that's going to be part of an ongoing series. And that was only brought up early in the script. That's just a script note. And uh, I think uh, Annabelle is a smoother character now. She's a little deeper, which is good in terms of any. And you can see something's going to develop nicely between Annabelle and Cassie. Mm -hmm. I think that's good. And uh, the, it's not a sitcom in that sense, but it's, it's more of a, a story that has comedic moments to it. Character from the character, not a joke, but the response of uh, one of the characters to the other character. I think the audience realizes it's, it, that's what you do when you're nervous. You try to make something a little funny sometimes. So um, I think it's, the story is well laid out. I think the conflict is there that Annabelle loves her father but is old enough to understand that he's an astronaut. I think that could, uh, I think we could probably add a moment where we find her on the phone to Emma. So she's not around anybody of the other characters except for the audience, that uh, she's reminding him, well, he is an astronaut, and it's important what he's doing. She's trying to persuade herself by talking to Emma. That might be a, a moment or a <coughs> interesting to it. Um, she's a young girl. She probably has lots of friends on the phone, always on the phone. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the father can say, well, we're going to be on the phone, too. It's just this is the longest FaceTime call them horrible, <laughs> just to kind of bring it down and remind the audience that that's going to be a device, hopefully, the series we use. And uh, it's a, each time this has been rewritten, it's got to be better than the previous uh, script. And uh, I think it's clear. Uh, uh, those are my thoughts. Uh, 
completing this final draft. And of course, uh, I think you guys read well and kind of gradually get into it. And, and so, uh, uh, everything, not everything, but so much of it is in the casting when, when it really happens. Uh, because these are the people that the audience is going to spend time with these characters. And they'll want to return next week to spend time with the character. They don't know what next week's story is going to be about. It but they know it's going to entail, uh, involve these characters. And that's what the TV's about, the promise of next week. And it's character driven. Um, and it's, uh, I think it's adult enough that kids, the 9, 12, 13, 14, will get a sense of what this young girl's going through. Or maybe some of the audience has had a situation like that. One doesn't know about the audience because you don't. It's on the other side of the screen. But uh, those that decide on whether these kind of shows get made realize there's a hook for this generation for Annabelle. Annabelle is a child and she's an adult and she's torn in both ways. She has responsibilities to her father. I don't know if, uh, if we ever find her talking to her mom. You know, I mean, her mom is gone, of course, but it doesn't mean the not gone from her mind. She can call her mom up anytime she wants to. So uh, that might be a device. Right. Or in the world, too, of uh, a video, you know, I'm sure that the family might, might even have some uh, you know, footage. Oh, some family footage. Yeah, sure, family sure. Footage, yeah, like and that. she still has some of that on her iPhone or, or whatever phone she's using. And that's a comfort to her. And uh, yeah. It's not strange talking to a person that's deceased. Uh, they're always available to listen. <laughs> so uh, I think that's a, a unique that she still maybe we find her momentarily talking to her mom. Not maudlin, mm -hmm. but uh, and, and not often. Uh, she talks to the doggy. You know. So those are my initial thoughts. Yeah. I think the story is clear, and each act builds on what information we had in the previous act. I don't think the audience is, should, would be lost anywhere in the story. Right. So I think that's important that they, they, each character is specific enough and dynamic enough that they uh, fulfill a part of her world that we're going to see week to week and become extended family for us. I think that's important. Yeah, I think that's important too because, you know, a lot of mothers, you know, a lot of single dads, single moms in the world today, they do have these extended families and a lot of times those extended families are their friends and neighbors who they've built a little community around. So I like that, that uh, nuance in, in the storytelling. Uh, I want to say that, you know, this exercise, uh, you know, came about because we, there was questions about, you know, how does a how do we create a pilot and how does a writer's room work? And so what I really think we should commend our little group here, the writer's room, is that they were able to get together, forge an energy, and come up with an idea of what the idea was, uh, Bob came up with this idea, but then the group galvanized their thought process around that idea. And it's very obvious, as Steve had pointed out, that from the first draft and the subsequent drafts that have come along, you can see how the, the script has really evolved. And gotten richer. And yeah. And I think that that's a real credit to the writer's room for getting that to happen. So again, you know, that, that this shows that, you know, writers, people uh, can get together behind a creative process and a thought and uh, put their stuff aside and say, okay, we all see the vision, now let's let's work together to make it happen. So that's this is a, a, a wonderful example of how people can get together uh, in the, and they do it every day in television. They get together and they come up with these fascinating stories and they hopefully build an audience week after week after week to sure. come back. Mm -hmm. And it's an interesting dy dynamic with a young daughter and a father who's not there, but still a father, that we're going to see each week. And Cassie, and, uh, it's playing on a lot of levels. 
So I think that's engaging to the audience. Um, yeah, I mean, there's little nuanced things like, you know, um, being that he's a, uh, an astronaut, generally astronauts are pretty smart guys, and very, very, uh, you know, so when, when he interviews uh, the very first one who's talking about, you know, the alkaline water. Uh, I would, know, uh, knowing in my mind that, well, the astronaut really knows what that really is, but he's just wondering what's this dingbat going to come up with kind of a thing. So how, you know, so from a, you know, from a, from a, uh, uh, playing, playing that role point of view, I would say that, you know, Tom is almost like, okay, well, uh, yeah, let me see what this one's going to pull out of her hat. And that kind of, and I think that goes back to what you were saying, it's, it's, not the, it's not the comedic lines that we need, but it's the nuances that right. the characters do that give it the sense of comedy. Oh, okay, yeah, oh, right. wow, this one's, you know, that kind of thing. Because our, rela our relationship is going to be with the ongoing characters. Right. So that'll be easier to, it doesn't have to be a joke, and maybe in some script it will be, but uh, it's a lighter moment that where she, she, the characters are sharing with their partners, the audience. Mm -hmm. When you guys write, do you, does every, somebody take the voice of a character usually? Or? Uh, I think you can direct that to Barbara and the writer's group. We actually did not take voices of characters like that. Mm -hmm. We just talked about them and what their interaction was. We were trying to write things on levels that would appeal to all stages of parenting, the parent-child from the child's age up to the babysitter who's going to be maybe sometimes watching the show, to the young young marrieds or the dating with the Gus and Cassie, mm -hmm. all the way to the grandparents kind of thing. Uh, are there grandparent images and how they all work together. I think there were six of them that had that relationship. And in studying sitcoms or relationships and shows that have worked, you always have, excuse me, Stephen, but this is how I think, and you always have, for instance, I use the Mary Tyler Moore show, You've always got Mr. Grant there. Mm. And then you got Mary around things which were, you know, the things that were, and then you've got the people coming at her. Um, and this As an actor, when I first got the script and read it, and, <laughs> and because of today's atmosphere politically and, and the scripts that I've been seeing on TV, I thought she's going to turn into an ax murderer. I just know. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> I was happy she didn't. Well, <laughs> this far, the but, whole yeah. the whole premise of the show and what I think we need in today's political society is we need our children to feel safe, to grow up emotionally safe and physically safe. And the whole point for me of the show is to show how the child, how important it is for the child to feel safe. Uh, maybe we aren't all as safe as we'd like to think we are, but the child needs to feel safe. And that can, can be conveyed her talking to Emma. We don't need to see Emma. She's on the other end of the phone. Who is Emma? Emma, we, as a best friend. Well, best friend. Best friend. Uh, At some point we'll meet her. But, uh, oh, sorry, okay. You know, she feels safe. Yeah. Uh, when she leaves the room, I don't need to call, call Emma. Okay. Uh, I, I also think too that the, the interesting dynamic of the show. I mean, of course, we have this interesting, you know, play between the dad being on the space station and him being able to communicate with his daughter almost every day. But to me, it's going to be interesting the relationship that Cassie and uh, Annabelle, because that is that is a you know, it's almost like it's almost like she becomes the mother of. You know the mother that she, that, so it's going to be interesting. You know how that, how that the op, the opportunities and the possibilities that that and could that, bring that in. And that lovely scene where she she goes towards her and then you know yeah. I'm thinking about my yes. mother and she backs yeah. away from her. Mm -hmm. That was really good. Right. Mm -hmm. 
to hear what Constance has to say is very interesting to me because Constance was our savior. She showed up uh, at the very last minute, last night, essentially. <laughs> I got the script, read it, and we have how it impacted her. And then we had her reaction today. So that tells me a lot about the script because you you had a hard time, I mean, you had a hard situation, and the Three fact shots. that you gripped what was going on so quickly made me feel good, and I'm sure the other writers. Yes. So thank you for that. Thank you all for that. Is it okay if I make a comment? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. I'm also in the writer's group. Um, mm -hmm. So this is the second table read I've done, but this is the second character, but in between, I just finished doing a play at the CB Rep with the Children's Conservatory, so I was on stage with 29 kids from ages 6 to 14. Mm -hmm. And um, 29 new little people in my life. Um, and I think they would love the script, even the six-year-old. Because um, I was, and I'm also a marriage and family therapist, and work with a lot of kids. And so I was really kind of looking at them as we were you know, doing this play, like how different they are than like when I raised my kids. You know, they're so much more, um, they're so much more expanded, but they're also still just little kids. Right. And um, so a couple things, reading Annabelle, um, and this is just a tidbit, but on page four, she has a little four sentence thing and five times, this, five times it says she, 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 she. And that's gonna be hard for a kid to say, it could be shortened like mom said, and she, you know, like just shorten that a little. And then it says he, they're gonna go like, who's he? You know, instead of, just put dad in there instead of he. You know, mom, like start with mom, last sentence is dad. So they know, oh, we're still in the mom and dad. Because they get confused right. easily. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, the last thing you don't like want that. is an audience saying, well, wait a minute, what did, I know, as they're thinking about the clarity of what they just heard, they just missed another page of dialogue. Mm -hmm. Right, so they're gonna miss so, what's next. Because um, I noticed it with our kids on the stage that we had to shorten some of the things because they were just confused. <clears throat> but they're worldly. But they're still <coughs> little kids and get confused easily. So it's on the bottom of page four. And then um, when Cassie's being interviewed, there's like six pages where we don't see Annabelle. And the kids are going to lose attention if we don't have some visual contact with Annabelle because it's the grown ups talking and they're just going to go, the kids will just lose it. But she says she's going to go to do her homework. So you can have a, a, a scene where you just shoot her doing her homework. And then when she comes back, um, you know, it's like, where did she just come back for? You could show her, like, closing her homework books. And then she comes back into the room. So the, the kids, the thing that I found is kids always wanted to know what was the main kid doing at all times, even if they weren't on the stage. So she could, you know, you're saying during when Cassie's being interviewed? Mm -hmm. the, because that's the longer interview. Right, you could cut to a shot of her yes. kind of at the other end yes. side of the door. Yeah. Trying or she to could fit. come down with a question about her homework or something. Well, my other thought was that she could eavesdrop, sit with the dog yeah. and eavesdrop right. on all yeah. the interviews. Yeah. 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 Like, we keep cutting away to her, like, oh, whew, what's that first one? Good. Who's the second one? <laughs> Not her, good. The dog doesn't like her. <laughs> you know, so she could eavesdrop. She could be talking to Rusty. Yeah, yeah. and she, yeah, she could have a conversation with Rusty. And then the other thing that threw me at the end is when she said, I, I knew it was you when we first Skyped. It's like, well, when did she Skype? I, well, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah that's, I, uh, it kind of threw me off, like, they already know each other, um, which is fine, but it's like, if she Skyped with her, when did she Skype? It just kind of threw me off. Right, right. And, uh, not that it's not possible. Right. That is between Act 2 and Act 3. So. Oh, I missed it then, I'm sorry. No, no it wasn't correct. Right. No. Oh, it wasn't a correct. Oh, it's not right. in the story. It's oh, I see. Right. Okay. It's like, you know, it happened between, so it's... Off stage. It, it, yeah, it happened off stage. It, that's what... How Mark I took it. Right. Good but to kids show are... Yeah, was, your market audience is I think it would have been relevant to show the meeting and I'm maybe... Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Instead yeah. of it versus the Skype, maybe Skyping, but I think it was an important moment to have the, uh, the interview with the daughter with Annabelle called in or set up a meeting with her because I don't know that as good as she seemed and sounded, we still really want to see that 
interaction, Jay, right. you can just have her like pushing the button like Skype comes on. We don't know how, we don't have to know who she's Skyping. Right. And then that will take care of it. But what I really learned with these kids, like they're worldly, they're brilliant, they're IT savvy and everything, they're still kids and they're very concrete. Mm -hmm. But they need that continuity reminder. Mm -hmm. The, this, Skype, yeah, the Skype thing is, if you have the Skype type thing regardless, it's an opportunity for Tom to react to that as to how the two of them are connecting without him even knowing about it. And since that's going to be a device, you know, on screen communications, having that at least once in the first Introduced, episode yeah. would be a good thing. Right. And where does that take place again in this group? Oh, the yeah. Skype thing is at the end. Yes, yeah, so um, oh, it's at the, yeah, it's it's at at the beginning of act, act, uh, act three. Yes, when she comes. First uh, page in act three. When Cassie I knew comes you were to the, the door right and she goes, oh, I knew yeah. you were the right one. I saw you were the right one. met you on Skype. Right. right. Mm -hmm. I'd like to add something about Annabelle's character. Um, given, her, given the age of the character, the one thing I, and I write um, for young adults, and I mentor, young, I mentor middle school kids, girls. And um, the one thing I found, thought was missing was like the deep point of view behind, you know, what's behind this character. And since she's, um, this is about communication and rela maintaining relationships, the one thing I thought was missing was um, if her dad's leaving, even though she's, her mom's trying to prepare her for this, for her it's gonna be like a second abandonment. You know, mom has, died, so that's left her with just dad. And now, you know, for a 13-year-old or a 12-year-old, a year away is like a Eternity. month time away. Yeah. Yeah. And so even though she's trying to put on a brave front, inside she's going to be crushed like, yeah. oh my God, I'm orphaned. You know, that's going to be what she would say to Emma. Um, and I think it would be really a good, strong, ongoing thing and a good way to communicate how she's really feeling. I like the part with the dog. But I also like what you suggested, um, it was something I was thinking about as well, is having her talk to mom. Mm -hmm. And I think that maybe it would be really great if she said, Mom, I know I promised you I would, you know, support dad. I know I promised, you know, it would be like maybe that there had been a contract. Yeah, you know, they say so death never ends a death never ends a relationship. It struggles on in the survivor's mind. Yes. <laughs> and she is the survivor. And exactly. She can still call up her mom whenever she wants to. Well, I'm a shaman. I'm totally <laughs> <laughs> You're in my wheelhouse. Well, I, I, yeah, point, I think, the point uh, was much discussed and much debated, and it was voted uh, down as premature and as being too weak and immature. No, because she's trying. She's if she's trying to keep up. No, no, I'm not. I'm agreeing. I'm agreeing. Okay. I just have a comment for Annabelle again. On page eight to nine, she has a very long monologue. Um, and I noticed when the kids on the stage had longer than like, you know, four lines, five lines, everybody just zoned out. All the other kids were just zoning out on the stage, you know. Even though the kid on doing the piece had, you know, their little monologue. It's their attention span is very short. You could slip in a picture of mom talking to mom or I miss mom. We don't have to say I miss mom. She can just go take the picture and hold it or kiss right. it or... You know, maybe mom's the background of the bottom of the eight. Yes, or maybe condensed. Yeah, condensed. Mm -hmm. And like have a picture of mom, like, you know, instead of telling us I miss mom, you know, like I'm sleeping with mom's picture. Right, right. It's and on my pillow. She's showing what well. telling. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 I think that's it. Anywhere you can add a moment like that, a visual yeah. or a moment. Uh, because she's a kid. She's a kid. So she doesn't have the coping skills right. yet. She is really still very concrete. Right. You know? And she's you know, trying to act grown up, but she's got to do kid stuff. I mean, 11, 12 is young. This is yeah. it's very young. And it's also very conflicted age because they're, they want to be grown up and you know, they're trying to be grown up, but they're still kids. Yeah. I also yeah. thought in the first act there was a lot of repetition about um, how much this was dad's, <clears throat> it always been dad's dream, and I think we got it, we didn't need it to be, yes. you know, repeated quite, maybe quite so much. Um, or, and then again, that could be something where show instead of tell, where he could look at something that, um, 
you know, would show people that this had all these things. He can show her the family album, or Maggie can, of him with homemade drawings and rocket ships he's made and yeah. stuff. Or, yeah. or, you know, or I, one of the, I mentioned this the first time, but I really felt that there should have been a little bit more between Annabelle and her dad, more more substance and stuff. And I uh, even on this read through, I didn't get that. And that was one of the comments I had earlier on, that, you know, especially since the mom was gone five months ago, the, 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 the father and daughter relationship would, would make it even more of a conflict when he leaves. So I think that a lot, there could still be more in the, in the opening of that relationship. So likes her mom to braid her hair. Mom's not there, and Dad could try to braid her hair and not be doing a very good job, even after five months. You know, like she could say, "Oh, you're getting a little bit better." You know, <laughs> he's doing the best yeah. he can. I think he's doing it. Oh, I think he should. Be. No, well, no, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. You, you can do that. You can do that. <laughs> See him doing it for a moment, and then, yeah. then he's just finishing up. Yeah. And